Uh, welcome. Good evening. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this lecture and discussion on the role, the constitutional role of the Attorney General of Sri Lanka. This discussion is hosted by the International Center for Ethnic Studies, along with the Indian Law Review. As many of you would know, ICES is an institution that has been working since the early 1980s, um, engaging in research and advocacy on issues related to cultural pluralism and tolerance. The Indian Law Review is an academic-led, double-blind, peer-reviewed, generalist journal on the laws of the Indian subcontinent. My name is Dinesha Samraratna. I am an academic attached to the Faculty of Law of the University of Colombo. I am also a member of the editorial board of the Indian Law Review. And I will be your chair for this evening. During this session, we will be discussing a paper titled Between a Rock and a Hard Place, The Constitutional Role of the Attorney General in Sri Lanka by Sanjit Dias. Sanjit Dias is a LLB graduate of the University of Colombo and is an attorney at law. To respond and comment on his paper, we have with us today three eminent panelists. Uh, we have Professor Savitri Gunasekara, Emeritus Professor and former Vice Chancellor of the University of Colombo. We also have with us Mr. Salia Piris, President's Counsel, the President of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. And last but not least, we have Ms. Shahid Abari, former Deputy Solicitor General, presently engaged in private practice with Heritage Partners. We will proceed as follows. Mr. Dias will present the key arguments in his paper for about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, I think he has paste, uh, posted, I'm sorry, a full uh, link to the full draft of his paper, uh, which you may access. Uh, after Mr. Dias presents the key arguments of his paper, we will turn to our discussants who will each speak for eight to 10 minutes. Thereafter, we will open for Q&A. So during uh, the first part of our proceedings, if you have any questions or comments, I would encourage you to make a note of it or place it in the chat. And when we open up for Q&A, you can take them up uh, there. So thank you very much and welcome once again. Sanjit, over to you. Thanks, Dinesha. Um, let me just share my presentation. My screen can be seen? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me begin by thanking uh, ICS uh, for hosting this event uh, jointly with uh, the Indian Law Review. Uh, this takes me back to uh, my first day constitutional class uh, in Dinesha's class, where despite uh, Dinesha's reputation, we turned up for class on occasion without having done the assigned reading. So the link to the draft paper is in the uh, uh, chat, I think. I think I posted it about twice. Uh, but this is really going to be a lightning presentation of some of the main uh, arguments that I make. So if you want it discussed uh, further, that will happen, I suppose, in the Q&A. So in, uh, at pages four to seven, I trace the evolution of the Attorney General's department uh, and look at the way it was structured under different uh, constitutional frameworks. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to be doing in the, uh, primarily in this presentation is looking at the two main constitutional roles that I discuss in the paper, that is in respect of fundamental rights and parliamentary bills. I'm then going to look into the principles around presidential immunity and what uh, courts have said about it up to now. Uh, and then moving to the main part of my argument, which is uh, where I argue that even in respect of proceedings brought against the president under Article 35, that the Attorney General has a discretion about whether or not to defend the president. Uh, and then I propose some alternatives or ways forward uh, under this interpretation of the Constitution. So I begin then with this question of the constitutional, the AD's constitutional role in respect of fundamental rights. Now, Article 4D of the Constitution speaks about how 
all organs uh, of government uh, must respect, secure, and advance fundamental rights. Uh, and I don't think there is any contention that the Attorney General is also an organ of government and probably best identified as an executive organ of government, even though it has certain uh, quasi judicial functions. Uh, there are cases in which uh, the courts have commented on the fact that the Attorney General's powers uh, are in the nature of executive powers and uh, may even be subject to review by the courts. Now, under Article 34.1 of the Constitution, the AG is merely entitled to be given notice of fundamental rights applications that are filed and has the right to be heard. And on that framing, it takes the character of an amicus and a friend of the court, amicus curiae, where he assists court in respect of these fundamental rights applications. In terms of what the constitutional provisions say, that is all it says about these fundamental rights cases uh, generally in under, under Article 134. But the practice uh, of the department for many years has been that it routinely appears for party respondents in fundamental rights application. So these are typically, uh, they may be a secretary who has failed to act in accordance with the circular, a school principal who has failed to give effect to a circular in admission or promotions, various cases like that. Uh, and what I reflect on in the paper is that it is very different for the attorney general to defend party respondents that are state respondents, state functionaries in fundamental rights applications compared to defending uh, officers of the state in civil litigation. Okay, this was anticipated, but I think I'm still connected. Um, so I, in the paper, I, uh, I, I draw this as a parallel to almost uh, one arm of the state, that is when one arm of the state violates fundamental rights, the other branch of the state, that is the attorney general, when it appears for party respondents is uh, almost colluding in that action by justifying the violation. Whereas the AG's role should be to, as an organ of state, to uphold the uh, constitution and advance its fundamental rights. Now, in the attorney general's department, there is a practice of not appearing in torture cases, that is violations of Article 11. Uh, and that is an anomaly in this general position that is taken, but even within that anomaly, it is not applied consistently. So there are some torture cases in which the AG does appear for some of the respondents and other cases in which it doesn't. So I draw on this anomaly later on, but I also draw a principle from this practice that at some level there seems to be uh, an acknowledgement that the, it is inappropriate for the attorney general to be seen to defend very heinous violations of fundamental rights. So I then move into the other role that the attorney general plays, which is in respect of parliamentary bills. Now, in terms of the constitution, this is the only provision in which the language of duty is used in relation to the attorney general. And Article 77 says, it shall be the duty of the attorney general to review bills for constitutionality. Uh, now, I in the paper I talk about, I, I refer to this uh, nascent school of constitutional law, which is on the idea of uh, institutions protecting constitutional democracy. Uh, that particular framing or language is used in the South African constitution in chapter nine. And the basic premise of these institutions are that the traditional branches of government, that is the legislature and the executive, and sometimes the judiciary at times have conflicts in promoting constitutional democracy. Now, what I mean by that is when a government in power is animating the legislature, they have a conflict in ensuring, let us say, that uh, uh, boards are drawn in a particular way or that elections are held entirely freely and fairly because once they are in power, they want to continue to remain in power. And that is the basis for these institutions protecting constitutional democracy, which act as an additional check. Sometimes they are called guarantor institutions. Uh, there is discussion about whether they form a guarantor branch, a separate branch of government. But in the uh, paper, I, I talk about how the Attorney General 
appears in this because of the way this duty is cast on the attorney general in respect of parliamentary bills that the attorney general takes on the characteristic uh, or the character of an institution protecting democracy and if you look at the scheme of article 77 which i elaborate in the paper uh, the ag interacts with all three traditional branches of government and actually has three opportunities with e one with each branch of government to ensure constitutional compliance i elaborate on that in the paper but in uh, stark contrast to this ideal or this constitutional framework uh, the practice of the attorney general's department uh, has been to routinely sign off on government bills um, and i think most recently in the uh, one of the very recent examples was the port city economic commission bill where there were numerous the supreme court held that numerous provisions were inconsistent with uh, the constitution but that bill was defended by the uh, attorney general and in fact the attorney general uh, typically only opposes private member bills that are presented so uh, in the paper i argue that in respect of these two constitutional roles in respect of fundamental rights and parliamentary bills that the attorney general has drifted from the role that the constitution envisages. Now, very quickly moving on to presidential immunity, uh, there are two principles that emerge from our jurisprudence, and these two cases in particular have been referenced uh, throughout. Uh, one is Malika Rati versus Shiva Pasupati, Attorney General, and the second one is Karnatilaka versus Disa Nayaka. Uh, and uh, in Malika Rati, the court talks about how so the rationale for immunity is not that the president can do no wrong, but it is purely for the smooth and efficient working of government. And uh, in the paper, I, I examine the, the jurisprudence a little more in detail, but I also comment that it is important to uh, view those uh, precedents circumspectly because after the 19th Amendment, uh, all official acts of the uh, president, not just his acts in his capacity as a minister, were liable to fund the fundamental rights jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. And when the 20th Amendment bill attempted to repeal or work back those, walk back those provisions, the Supreme Court very resolutely defended that provision and said that, that uh, to do so would be inconsistent with the judicial power of the people and therefore inconsistent with Article 3, that is Article 4. So I draw on these two things. On the, so you have two things to balance here. You have the Attorney General's role as captured in the Constitution versus the rationale for presidential immunity. And in the paper, I argue, I use five arguments to really say that the Attorney General still maintains the discretion to on whether or not to defend the president. And actually, the only uh, uh, only provision I could find or the comment I could find was an obituary remark in Malikarachi where the court said that uh, the presidential, in cases where the action is brought against uh, challenging an act of the president as a minister, that the AG was constitutionally liable to defend it. So I argue in the paper that that is obituary to begin with and therefore not binding, but I also argue that that doesn't fully appreciate the uh, constitutional scheme. So my first argument is based on basic rules of interpretation. Uh, con statutes, if the constitution is also a statute, it must be read as a whole. And where language is clear and unambiguous, the court must give effect to its plain meaning. Now, when the framers of the constitution in one place, that is Article 77, have chosen you to use the explicit language of saying there is a duty on the attorney general to do something, and that language is absent in another provision that is article 35 1 which talks about how act, where actions may be brought against the president then you have to give some there has to be some inference from that deliberate omission and i argue that clearly the framers did not intend there to be a duty on the attorney general to defend the president uh, in that light the second argument goes back to the discussion that i had on uh, the attorney general's role in respect of parliamentary bills uh, and it's very clear if you read the scheme of article 77 that even if the attorney general is consulted on draft versions of the bill 
or his, 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 uh, his, uh, his advice is sought, when it comes to a finalized bill that is tabled, he must give his independent opinion on its constitutionality. And so I argue that his duty to defend the constitution takes precedent over the role as chief legal advisor to the government or any other role that he plays. And therefore, by analogy, in fundamental rights applications, the duty to defend the constitution uh, and to protect fundamental rights as an organ of the state takes precedence over anything else. Uh, in the third argument, I get a little facetious and I make the point that the attorney general is really paid by the taxpayer. So lawyers, clients are typically the people who pay them. And the attorney general as a lawyer as well is paid by the people. Uh, he prosecutes criminal cases on behalf of the people. And in this case, this, uh, two cases, the Grand Central Limited versus Land Reform Commission, the Court of Appeal, and then again, which went up to the Supreme Court, the court explicitly recognized that the Attorney General doesn't act for any person or persons, but acts on behalf of the people. So I use that to make the argument that the Attorney General must always act on behalf of the people. And so if in his opinion, to defend a particular state functionary is to serve the interests of his two clients, the people, then he may do so in good faith. But if to defend a particular functionary is to perpetrate a, 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 an injustice or an infringement of fundamental rights of his client, then he must not, he must refuse to do that. Uh, the fourth point I make is that the, these powers must be exercised in trust for the public. Uh, all public power is held in trust. We have numerous decisions of the Supreme Court that make this point. Uh, very recently, Justice Janaki Silva, in uh, this case, Center for environmental justice versus Mahindra Advaksa says that quite explicitly says that powers of the attorney general are hidden public trust. And so when the public trust doctrine applies, naturally the decisions of the attorney general must be in the interest of the public and for their benefit. So he cannot defend a functionally like the president in a situation where, or he should not, in a situation where uh, that is doing an injustice to the public. Or, or it, perpetrating a violation of fundamental rights. And finally, and this is a bit technical, but I draw an analogy from the process of impeachment, where in impeachment proceedings, the attorney general plays no role in defending the president when the president is entitled to be heard in person or by an attorney at law. So my argument is that in impeachment, the, the ramifications or the uh, consequences are much graver than in fundamental rights application. And yet the attorney general is asked to stand aside. So in fundamental rights cases, surely the attorney general should at least have the discussion on a case by case basis to decide whether or not to defend. So in looking at how to then interpret this provision uh, and move forward, I say that you have to give meaning to the expression instituted against the attorney general. Actually, if you think about the very expression instituted is, is to begin, right? To begin a legal process. So in the paper, I argue that that language is used to inform people that this process must be begun against the attorney general, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all proceedings have to be continued with the attorney general defending the president. So I have suggested two alternatives. One is where either the state attorneys within the department uh, do the instructing work, but retain outside counsel or after the first appearance and after the attorney general communicating his decision to both the president and to court that he will not appear, that then the brief can be given to uh, a private lawyer of the uh, president's choosing. Um, and in the Port City Bill determination, actually this was seen quite clearly where even though the attorney general appeared to defend the bill, uh, there were at least four intervenient petitioners who were very closely linked to the government. One was a minister, two secretaries and uh, the, the, the main political party that formed the government, they intervened and they made submissions through their uh, teams of lawyers, which shows that Supreme Court can certainly accommodate such a process. So in conclusion, I say that there are these conflicting sets of principles, the uh, AD's constitutional role, which I say is always to act in the interest of the public uh, and the rationale for presidential immunity, but the scheme as it exists can be interpreted to give the attorney general the discretion to decide on a case by case whether or not to defend the president. And I make the point that in terms of constitutional compliance, 
by having the attorney general routinely appear for these respondents, either the president or other respondents in fundamental rights applications, actually uh, creates a moral hazard where public functionaries uh, violate fundamental rights with impunity because they know that there is a whole department that is available free of cost to them to defend their actions if they are ever challenged. And that is why I say that the attorney general should not play that role, but should take the position of deciding on a case by case basis, which will then uh, ensure stronger uh, constitutional compliance by government. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanjit. Uh, I would now like to invite Professor Gunasekara to respond to uh, the presentation. Over to you, Professor Gunasekara. Professor Gunasek, yes, now we can hear you. Dr. Dinesh Samranathna, I guess lecturer, attorney at law, Sanjit Dias, uh, her colleagues on the panel and participants at this visual virtual meeting. Thank you, Sajit, very much for sharing your scholarship with us this evening. Uh, congratulations to you too on your scholarship to Harvard which I hope will provide enormous opportunities for you to come back and make a contribution in your career, both as a legal academic and a member of the bar. It is indeed a pleasure to participate in this panel and have a conversation on your important research. Your work addresses a topic of special interest in our current devastating and unprecedented uh, economic and political crisis. The rule of law, accountable governance, and the role and responsibility of those who hold public office to the people of the country have become everyday concerns for all of us citizens. The role and responsibility of the Attorney General and his department as public officials in law enforcement, including prosecutions, has been a traditional area of both public concern and controversy. Just a few days ago, there was media concern about the incidents in Mirihana, which were a preface to what we now describe as a social movement called the Aradalia, and the whole focus on uh, enforcement of law and prosecutions. There have been emblematic cases, for example, the Krishanti Kumaraswamy case, uh, the Elsa Pereira case on child abuse, Kumaraswamy case was on rape and murder, uh, the Richard Soiza and La Santa Vikramatunga murders, and the, Rush, the case of the Russian tourist murder and rape. And in these instances, the Attorney General and his or her department have a track, has protected both public concern and comment. However, though we have had, though we have had, uh, we, uh, significant litigation and jurisprudence in our Supreme Court in the area of constitutional law, fundamental rights, and the role uh, and fundamental rights, the role of the Attorney General has been discussed even in scholarship, very incidental. Now your scholarship is an important contribution and focuses on this neglected area. Using human rights language, I would say that your scholarship provides an in-depth analysis on the constitutional provisions and jurisprudence in regard to the role of the Attorney General and his department and their responsibility to respect, protect, and fulfill the norms and standards set by our Constitution. Uh, you have focused especially on the important area of litigation for violation of fundamental rights guaranteed by the Constitution, judicial review of proposed legislation or bills, and constitutional imperatives when the government enacts laws, implements policies, and makes administrative decisions of importance. And this is particularly important in a context where, after the 19th Amendment, the President himself uh, can be liable for violation of fundamental rights under Article 35. And this has not been removed even in the 20th Amendment, which gave him extensive powers. 
I see, however, a gap in regard to violation, the area of violation of fundamental rights by non-stakes actors, which uh, can perhaps be addressed when publishing this research. There is jurisprudence in our country, for example, FICE versus Attorney General, which creates an obligation of due diligence on the government and the state to prevent violations of fundamental rights by non-state actors. This aspect indeed surfaced recently in the, in the, um, in the uh, Port City litigation. This will be an area of growing concern in promoting the accountability of the Attorney General and his staff when there is even greater engagement of the corporate sector and private sector in the economy. Sanjit's analysis of constitutional provisions and jurisprudence in the Supreme Court provides strong arguments for an alternative discourse on the role and responsibility of the Attorney General and his department in the public service of this country. The popular perception is that they are the servants of government rather than public servants. Sajit, Sanjit has demonstrated in this research that the Attorney General and his staff, though part of the executive branch of government, are not just public servants who must fulfill the political agenda of a government in office. He shows how the law and the constitution of the country have given the AG and his staff independence from political authority because of an important responsibility placed upon them as trustees and guardians of the public interest. Uh, they have a duty which is linked closely to the rule of law uh, and the impartial, objective, and effective administration of justice. Sanjit argues that the quasi-judicial role is embedded in the hybrid office of the Attorney General under the Constitution of 1978. And the argument is that procedural provisions such as that the Attorney General's as a right to be noticed in FR cases, fundamental rights cases, or be added as a respondent, must not be interpreted to undermine the core concept and substantive law in the Constitution on this matter. He also uh, looks in this context, as he has explained to us, of the issue of impeachment of the president. And I think one of the interesting points he makes is that even that allows the president to retain his own attorney at law. So therefore, we don't see this engagement of the Attorney General in a professional capacity. The jurisprudence that Sanjit discovers, such as the leading case of Land Reform Commission versus Grand Central Limited, decided in 1981, after the Constitution of 1978 was adopted, uh, reflects the same, uh, reflects support for this role for the AG and his responsibility uh, under the Constitution, the basic law of the country. I think it would be useful to also consider the jurisprudence in cases decided by great justices like Mark Fernando and E.R.B. Amrasinghe on the concept of a public trust and the duties and responsibilities of all public servants as guardians of the public interest. This jurisprudence, to my mind, reinforces, uh, Sajit, your argument on the uh, importance of uh, the, uh, on the importance of the Attorney General's responsibilities and his department's responsibilities as public, as in the public interest I, and as, as, as the guardians of the public interest. I would like to also see a further elaboration of the impact of colonial English law in the current constitutional position on the hybrid role and responsibility of the Attorney General. The Donamo Commission the Solbury Commission and the Constitution of 1948 embedded this same version, Sanjit, that you're talking about, of the quasi-judicial role and responsibility of the Attorney General, even though he was part of the executive. The quasi-judicial role resulted, indeed, in the AG also being perceived as a head of the professional body of lawyers known as a bar, and ranking in the order of precedence 
below the Chief Justice and above the judges of the Supreme Court. The 1972 Constitution, however, changed this concept uh, with its concept of, con of the sovereignty of the people exercised by Parliament as a supreme instrument of state power. So that concept shifted the role of the aid and responsibility of the Attorney General away from what it was perceived traditionally according to the influence of English law norms and standards. Uh, however, there was a reversal to that original concept, to my mind, in the Constitution of 1978, which went back again to that concept of other, other concept of the, of the Attorney General as having a quasi uh, judicial role and as a clear role of acting in safeguarding the uh, and protecting the public interest and i think that's why it's important to set the context for this discuss discussion on the role and responsibility of the attorney general uh, because we see that the negativity to a past and uh, it, it's important to see that because uh, it, 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 it's, it, it is very much an ethos which in some ways has become alien in, to our country. And why has it become alien? Sajid has recorded the political changes in government that have undermined the scope for the AG and the ASCA and his staff to feel, fulfill their constitutional mandate and role and responsibilities as uh, Sanjit has analyzed them. Of course, as Sanjit has pointed out, there are uh, instances uh, which don't fall into that same popular perception of the AG and his department as the servants of the government. For example, in torture cases, as he points out, the Attorney General sometimes does not appear. And I can think of the late Kam uh, Attorney General Kamar Sabesan, who refused to appear uh, for the control of immigration when he in litigation against regulations that he was enforcing in regard to citizenship. And then of course, there are also uh, instances where sometimes the attorney general takes up a position, for example, saying, well, this bill is absolutely constitutional, like in the case of the Port City Bill, and embarrassingly from the point of view of the public, the Supreme Court decides that there are many provisions which are unconstitutional. So there are variations, but in that sense, no consistency. And we know that increasingly the space for the Attorney General and his department to form the role that you are talking about, uh, fulfilling the vision of the Constitution as you have analyzed it, is decreasing. So I hope that this evening we will discuss whether uh, the current context reveals a need, not just uh, subject for procedural changes, but significant changes through a constitutional amendment that will embed the concepts of the constitution that you are talking about, clarifying the AG's quasi judicial role and his role as guardian of the public interest. Do we need, for instance, a director of public prosecutions uh, in a department of public prosecutions also headed by the attorney general on the basis of his independence and his quasi-judicial role? Using concepts of the actio popularis of the civil law uh, and the related action of the common law, is there a case for giving him a specific role in public interest litigation? Can his advisory role be also retained, uh, but, in only in, uh, but in regard to uh, constitutional issues and bills coming to parliament, or perhaps even as a kind of amicus curiae, providing an independent opinion to court? Should we follow the provisions, for example, in the Irish constitution and have provisions on the AG's appointment and dismissal, which are 
similar to those of judges of the Supreme Court. Should another official like Queen's advocate of colonial times and his department be tasked with becoming the routine legal advices systemic change and knowledge. Does realizing the concept of the AG as a gun of the public interest under the Constitution, as you have analyzed it and for, does that require substantive rather than procedural changes? Is a challenge now to do things differently and not place our Attorney General and his department between a rock and a hard place? but rather argue, lobby for the changes that will help him be a person in this important public office who will be a rock in a hard place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gunasekara. I would now like to invite Ms. Shahida Bari to respond to Sanjit's paper. Thank you. Thank you, Dinesha. Um, well, um, Sanjit, I would like to, at the outset, congratulate you on your analytical piece of work. Sanjit has grappled with and debates about an issue that has vexed many scholars, policymakers over the years. And he raises very pertinent issues regarding the role and function of the Attorney General. At the risk of oversimplifying the richness with which um, Sanjit addresses this issue, I have taken the liberty of distilling three main questions that have been raised by Sanjit. The first question that he raises is in a fundamental rights application, there's no requirement that the attorney general should appear for any respondent named in the petition. So why does the AG routinely appear? Why does the AG take upon himself or herself, the, herself uh, to come into court and move to obtain instructions. That's one of the questions that vexes him. Another question he raises is with regard to parliamentary bills. He asks why when the constitutional scheme envisages the AG as a guarantor institution, does AG routinely defend the vast majority of government bills and to, to find that the Supreme Court eventually strikes them down as being inconsistent with the constitution. Then finally, he poses the question as to why the AG takes up the defense of the president under Article 35 of the Constitution. And he interprets Article 35 to mean that even though the Constitution says that the, the proceeding should be instituted against the Attorney General, a private counsel may appear for and on behalf of the president. So the common underlying theme in all of the issues that Sandeep has raised is as to why the AG routinely appears and defends public officers in the circumstances that he has described. As a former officer of the Attorney General's Department, having worked there for 22 or more years and spent a long time in the Supreme Court unit, I have personal insights and professional in, uh, perspectives to share on the matters raised by Sanjit. But, be but before I elaborate on my own perspectives that somewhat differ from Sanjit's, I'd like to reiterate the core message that is captured in Sanjit's speech, which resonate with my own views. So I agree completely with Sanjit that the office of the AG of Sri Lanka is, is structured as a apolitical independent office. It is a structure that is maintained in Sri Lanka and Singapore and a few other countries, but has been abandoned by other jurisdictions, even UK and India. The AG and his officers are counsel and advisors to the state and not so much to the government. The dis, there's a distinction between the concept of state and the concept of government. A state will stand on its own in the abstract sense, regardless of who governs the state, and it's a distinct geographical entity with sovereignty. 
whereas the government is the instrumentality that makes and enforces the law uh, of the state that governs it. And we are all aware of the articles of the Constitution, Article 1, 2, 3, which specifically say, state that sovereignty is vested in the people and that it is inalienable. So therefore, the AG exercises, the fact that the AG exercises his powers in public trust is something that is commonly accepted. And I have, I absolutely agree with everything that uh, um, Sanjit said, said with regard to the AG's responsibility role and function in the constitutional structure. That the AG is not an extension or the mouthpiece of the government to slavishly yield to uh, political forces or blindly depend the parties and that subscribe to that are totally subscribed to that view. Naturally, then the question arises, and someone like Sanjit can uh, clearly ask the question: Then why do you routinely appear and defend? Why have you done so in all your years at the Attorney General's Department? I will endeavor to comment on these questions while reflecting on my personal experience. Now in a fundamental rights application, as you all are aware, Article 134 uh, provides for the AG uh, to be noticed and to be heard. And in terms of the Supreme Court rules, AG has to be made, made a party. But in a fundamental rights application, what is being challenged is the executive and administrative action of a public officer. And when, in oftentimes, when you say executive and administrative action, the public officer is acting in a public capacity, in his official capacity. And usually as a chief law officer of the state, when the AG receives notice and the respondents are public officers, the, uh, the, as opposed to uh, public corporations, public officers would mean officers of a ministry or a department, the attorney general would take notice. So the reason for this has some legal backing. Firstly, most of you are aware of, of the provisions of uh, uh, chapter 31 of the CPC, which in which says that action by or against the state will be instituted by or against the Attorney General. Section of the proceedings for prevention or redress of wrongs, so all proceedings are captured. And more importantly, there's chapter 33 of the Establishments Court, which the courts have recognized as, ha recognized as having forced the law. It sets out the rules pertaining to defense of an action of a public officer in the official capacity. So rule uh, B 6.6 .6 of chapter 33 of the uh, E-Code says, where in proceedings for enforcement of fundamental rights applications under article 126 of the constitution, allegations of a personal nature, including allegations of torture or assault are made against a public officer, such official officer should arrange for his defense through his own lawyer and may seek reimbursement of his expenses under chapter 11 at the conclusion of the proceedings. So I'm not going to take your time to read the entirety of chapter 33 or, or rule six, which sets out the circumstances of how the attorney general should undertake the defense of public officers. But this whole scheme envisages that in a, in, on a routine basis, the attorney general would appear for public officers. But if there are personal allegations made, or if there's an uh, allegation of uh, torture or assault, then the attorney general would refuse to appear. And if the court eventually holds that the allegations are not made out, an application can be made for reimbursement of costs. There, there is clear uh, policy justification also for uh, letting the public officer appear uh, through private counsel in assault and torture cases. Uh, because if there is a prima facie, the facts prima facie, uh, facie bear out that there uh, has been uh, instance of torture or um, assault, then it is likely that the attorney general would prosecute the person. 
the public notwithstanding the fact that the person is a public officer then clearly the attorney general cannot appear uh, for such a person similarly where personal allegations are made and where those are borne out for instance uh, if an allegation is made that a promotion is being denied to a person because of some private uh, land dispute between the parties or some other uh, factor which takes the uh, decision making process outside of the official realm then clearly the ag is mandated to refuse to appear often though in most applications of fundamental rights no such personal allegations are made uh, much of the uh, allegations are that the decisions are arbitrary unreasonable contrary to law against some form of government policy so therefore in these situations the uh, ag will be advised by his role and mandate given uh, the, the the structure formulated in the e code and as a first principle the uh, uh, the officers of the attorney general when a file is open and having received notice would um, take notice of the case and seek to, um, and uh, as a first at the first instance um, appear for the respondent but that is in situations where the allegations are made that the uh, actions are arbitrary unreasonable contrary to law and so on where it is serious enough to be considered a violation of a fundamental rights uh, or not on a is a decision to be made on an individual case by case analysis so prior to leave being granted the officer of the attorney general's department would consider the case and if it if there is a prima facie case that uh, in the view of that particular officer that there is in fact a clear violation of fundamental rights the uh, the general practice is to advise the person uh, the uh, the particular government department or ministry to settle the case if the officer is not satisfied that there is in fact a prima facie case of breach then he will endeavor to assist court with whatever material that has been made available within the short span of time usually before the uh, before leave is granted if leave is granted then there will be an endeavor made to call for fuller and further observations again at this point there will be a review by the officer to see whether this is a matter that that officer can defend if in the view of that officer there is justification for the decision that is been made then the officer will make a decision to proceed to appear for the respondent in that case so one cannot lose sight of the fact that the regardless of the fact that these are fundamental rights applications the process that the constitution has structured for hearing of these cases is an adversarial process and the state council will therefore present the case in the best interest of the state the state council's role is quasi judicial and not judicial not a totally judicial role it's a quasi judicial role only and therefore to some degree given that the state council is representing the public officer who the state council is satisfied has acted bona fide against whom no personal allegations are made there will be some degree of executive mindedness but that does not mean that the state council is defending a, a clear violation of the constitute constitution or a fundamental rights because until the decision is made by by the court of law that there has been an infringement it, in run, most of the cases it's a matter of degree and it's a matter of perspective and in this context i have to also mention that in every case where a public officer is made a respondent if that public officer has to run around looking for a private counsel it would lead to a great degree of administrative inefficiency because ultimately if the person is found uh, uh, not to have violated the fundamental rights then the, the cost of reimbursement would fall on the consolidated fund so therefore i think the present balance that has been struck where the ag decides whether uh, to refuse the brief or not is a uh, more equitable balance in the interest of the state because 
one must recall that the e code itself sets out the basic rule that uh, if there's an allegation of torture or personal allegation then uh, as a matter of course ag will not appear in other cases a case by case analysis will be made at the first level the office of state council handling the file would make a decision and if he decides that the, the brief has to be returned he will escalate it to his senior officers and a decision will be made as to whether the circumstances justify the returning of the brief so this is how the conduct of a fundamental rights application takes place and this is the reason and rationale for uh, state council to appear and defend what uh ali what's at until what are allegations of violations of fundamental rights uh before the supreme court if i may move now to bills miss bari i'm sorry to interrupt you but uh as chair i have to remind you that your time is up but right. i can uh, give you maybe two three minutes and then we can come back at, uh, in the q a and give you more time thank you yeah so with regard to so i will uh, quickly uh, summarize what i have to say about the bills and about article 35 with regard to bills uh, it is important to remember that uh, bills are a reflection of government policy and the ag's role is only to reflect and comment on the constitutionality so where the policy and the constitutionality collide the ag will not issue a certificate of constitutionality but once a certificate of constitutionality is in fact issued it is the bill that has been certified by the ag that the ag go, uh, proceeds to defend before the supreme court so it is again uh, uh, for the Supreme Court may eventually decide on the basis. The Supreme Court is not bound by its previous determinations. It is not bound by sort of uh, from the perspective of an executive. It is it can take broader perspectives into account, and therefore the Supreme Court can override pre previous dicta and hold bills to be unconstitutional. But mere fact that the supreme court holds it unconstitutional does not necessarily mean that this attorney general's original observations were in bad faith i will end by saying that i uh, with regard to article 35 uh, the cons in my mind it is quite clear that the attorney general has to appear for the uh, president the way the wording is in article 35 the, the there is no scope uh, the, the, the constitution has struck a balance between presidential immunity and accountability and provided for actions against the attorney general to proceed. This cannot be outsourced. The mouthpiece of the president at this point cannot be a private counsel because this is uh, the impugning the president's actions in an official capacity. So it is for the, the attorney general or any officer of the attorney general to remember that it is not his role to defend the president at this stage, but merely to present facts and assist court. But that does not mean that it is fit to outsource the role to a uh, outside counsel. So if I may so, uh, so quickly summarize my thoughts on my way forward on all of these. Uh, this is not to say that the conversation about the independence uh, of the AG is closed and not for a moment do I think that uh, there is uh, no room for improvement. Insulating the institution of the Attorney General from pol political interference is paramount. The conversation is, should continue. The uh, judiciary uh, should be acutely aware of its role and function to maintain checks and balances and therefore should always question the conduct of the attorney general and not take it for granted that uh, the decision making process is without political in interference but pin and also constitutional amendments to entrench the role of the attorney general very clearly as Pro uh, professor savitri gunasekhar suggested would also be useful but pending such far-reaching changes, I would say that each and every officer of the AGS department should um, set about their day-to-day -day tasks, reflecting on Samarakon CJ's words that as the attorney that the attorney general has a duty to court to the state and to the subject to be wholly detached, wholly independent, and to act impartially with the sole objective of, of establishing the truth. So I will stop there. Uh, having said that, I think uh, uh, 
Sanjit did comment on uh, the uh, recent uh, the Port City bill and how uh, third parties, I have uh, certain views on that and I don't think that was the ideal thing that happened. And I don't think that should be taken as a precedent uh, to justify uh, diminishing the role of the Attorney General in any way because what happened in the Port City Bill is unprecedented and contrary to the provisions of the Establishment's Code. Thank you very much, Ms. Barry. Uh, Mr. Piris, we are all yours now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, first of all, let me uh, commend Sanjit for this very thought of article and a very timely topic where I think the role of the Attorney General during the past few years, I think has come up for much discussion and debate and uh, to the, the extent of uh, public confidence uh, in, the, in the office of the Attorney General is being argued on. And at the same time, there is, a, there is also a debate whether what perhaps public perception also might be different from what actually things are. And uh, there are times when the Attorney General might have to take decisions which are not popular. I think Professor Gunasekara referred to the Elster Pereira case. Uh, now, the, I think the Elster Pereira case was a, is a case in point where uh, although the Attorney General was much criticized for, for having taken a decision not to prosecute, subsequent events seem to prove the Attorney General right. But having said that, I think, I think this topic is ex exceptionally important. And I'm happy that uh, Sanjit has uh, brought in this question of uh, public trust and that the AG must represent the people, that his primary duty is to represent the people of Sri Lanka, the sovereign people of Sri Lanka, and not necessarily to defend the government of the day. Now, having said that, I, I thought I will share a few thoughts um, uh, from my experiences. And also, I must say that uh, this, uh, the, this is an institution which I... I started my professional career in this institution, and it is an institution which I'm, I, I am personally I'm fond of this institution. But at the same time, I, I think looking at it from outside, uh, there are, I think, certain things which we can point out which should be corrected in the Attorney General's department. So uh, one thing I thought, Sanjit, perhaps you can focus on in your future research also, is that there is the removal of officers procedure act number five of 2002. And uh, that, in fact, sets out a special procedure for the removal of the Attorney General and, and the Inspector General of Police. And so that coupled with the process of appointment, of course, we know that the 20th Amendment has uh, again uh, brought, essentially brought the appointments of the Attorney General to its original position. But I think hopefully some things might change in the future. But I think the process of appointment and especially the process of removal is something we should think of because that guarantees the Attorney General protection. So the so those who are in the office of Attorney General really do, once you have assumed that office, I think there is enough space to be independent. Uh, I have, I have uh, witnessed uh, and also I have heard from other colleagues of how certain uh, the, uh, Attorneys General were able to refuse a wrong request from the executive. So there is this classic case of uh, one attorney general one uh, the, who was heard, uh, he had a, received a call from perhaps the highest person in the land and he had said, uh, he had used the words, machang ega karana be. So he told his friend, that cannot be done. So flatly, to flatly refuse what cannot be done. So I think that sets the standards. If the, I think the Attorney General should be in a position to tell the executive that what cannot be done, cannot be done. But here, I sometimes see that I, I see uh, members of the Attorney General's department appearing in cases, straining to defend certain actions of the executive. And uh, I might, must say that whether it is in defending bills or in defending certain fundamental rights applications. I would not want to be uh, to mention those specific ones by name because some of those cases are pending cases. But having watched those cases, we can see sometimes uh, they are straining uh, to defend. So then the question comes, should you defend the indefensible? Or should you say, should you leave, leave matters to court? And should you tell the court 
Well, these are the matters. This is the law. And uh, stop at that. But now, uh, one thing which I want to observe is also, uh, this is also subjective. Whether it mean, I don't know whether Shaina will agree with me, in fundamental rights applications, the approach of different officers of the Attorney General's department is also different from one another. So you might find one officer handling a fundamental rights in what we term the highest traditions of the Attorney General's department. And another officer going all out to defend the state, defend the executive, sometimes contrary to the, to the interests of justice. So this is where I, I, I do feel that the Attorney General, that the Office of the Attorney General, the, he, the, there must be standards set out which must be followed in all cases. So uh, now we know that in, 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 defend, in prosecuting criminal cases, there are certain uh, minimum standards which the Attorney General state of officers are supposed to follow. So for instance, you are not supposed to interview lay witnesses. Lay witnesses in criminal cases, the state counsel is pro uh, not expected to uh, discuss. Now, similarly, I would think in fundamental rights cases, or even, even in respect of bills, should there be a line which a state counsel representing the Attorney General should not cross? So this is something which I would like to highlight. Then also I would like to, like uh, perhaps Sanjit, in your, when you develop on this uh, topic, also to look at the constitutional role of the Attorney General in ensuring a fair trial in criminal cases. Because although we do not see it perhaps as a constitutional role per se, because of Vijay Pala's case and Article 13.3 of the Constitution, you, the, I think we must look at the constitutional role of the Attorney General in ensuring a fair trial. And this is where the Attorney General's power, criminal powers come into play. The power of indicting, the decision-making, and we know in Big Taiwan's case, the, Justice Mark Fernando has held that the, the, this is indeed uh, uh, the decisions of the Attorney General are subject to review. And I think we, we must look at, it is important for us to look at this aspect also. Uh, another thing which I would like to raise, how much is the Attorney General or the Office of the Attorney General accountable vis-a-vis uh, -vis other officers of the state? So you have high officers, secretaries to ministries, maybe uh, the Auditor General, maybe others who are held accountable in a, a, within the court process. But I, I'm just raising this question. I don't want to answer but, uh, that, but I just raised this, the question. Uh, are the courts generally reticent or reluctant to question the decisions of the Attorney General? Are, are the courts applying the same standards they would apply to other institutions to the Attorney General's decisions. So for instance, the decisions to, to prosecute, the decisions to withdraw indictments, I, I wish to raise that. Of course, having said that, I, I also want to just highlight the point that sometimes what the public perceive, uh, especially in, in criminal matters, of whether an indictment should be withdrawn, the decision of the Attorney General either to prosecute or not to prosecute, sometimes the public perceptions are different from what actually is. Very often the public do not understand that cases are based on evidence. And if the evidence is weak, the Attorney General might not be able to continue with the prosecution. And I think that is, that is one area where I think there is a misconception, a misunderstanding between the role of the Attorney General and the expectations of the, of the public in the country. On defending uh, the President and article, in terms of Article 35, I, I would like, perhaps we can discuss this today. Now, while accepting that generally the Attorney General, it is the role of the Attorney General to appear for the President, to what extent should the Attorney General go? Should the Attorney General go all out to defend the acts of the President? Now, if you, if you find some, some particular acts of the President, we say the, right, the granting of a pardon, the uh, dissolution of Parliament, should the Attorney General go all out to defend the acts of the President? Or should the Attorney General uh, take a, say, 
where he has advised the president perhaps on certain matters, then can he go to court and make submissions to court contrary to the advice he has perhaps privately given the president? So where, where would the Attorney General draw a line? Or should the, should the department build in certain protocols in respect of uh, how not only the president, but how state officers are defended? Uh, Sanjit has mentioned that in torture cases, the Attorney General generally does not appear. But I had a case, a police cell death. I appeared in a case, a, a, a death in police custody. It took 10 years, it was 10 years after the institution of the action that uh, the case was given in favor of the deceased wife, where the court held that there was a violation and that the killing was illegal. They are at the leave to proceed stage. The Attorney General vehemently defended the uh, police officers who were uh, uh, responsible uh, for the killing. And so much so, the, the objections filed by the Attorney General justified the shooting and tried to say that it was a, the man had struggled and he had shot. Whereas the court found so many, uh, uh, so, so many gaps in the uh, objections, uh, in the evidence presented by the relevant police officers. So, so where the, the question in, in this type of case is, uh, you, the AG is called upon to defend. Uh, very often we have a state council defending uh, police officers who are in fundamental rights cases, not only for torture, but illegal arrest. But on, again, you might be called upon at a different stage. A different officer of the Attorney General Department might be uh, called upon to decide whether to indict the person or not. So this is where I think uh, the former uh, chief, uh, chief justice, he was then, I think, uh, uh, justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Victor Tennakur. In the case of Senaviratna versus the Attorney General, this was the famous Dodampi Mudalali's case where the Attorney General uh, appeared as amicus at an inquest. And uh, this is what he, I just read the words he has observed. He had said that we are left with the impression that Crown Council was in reality there to watch the interests of the police. It is hardly necessary to add that the Attorney General's department should avoid at the early stages of any death in unusual circumstances, align itself with any persons who are interested in establishing a particular cause as to the cause of death. This can only lead to stultifying the department much to the public disadvantage. So I, I think uh, the, even the appearance of the Attorney General at the stage of inquests Sometimes there is pressure brought on to defend the police at cert in certain instances, and the attorney general comes in. But you, he then he is faced with certain. When I say the attorney general, that office is faced with difficulties because ultimately it, the the investigation might very well lead to charges of murder. Then how do you would you justify your early appearance? So these are some of the uh, some of the things which uh, I I can share. But I must also say that. Personally, uh, I, it, I, it's about 25 years since I first appeared in a fundamental rights application. I have seen a change in the approach of the, uh, the with respect to those uh, in the attorney general's department. But I, 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 my, my perception was in the early years that the attorney general, the officers of the department were more willing to uh, to to, to, have, to achieve, shall we say, via media and to try to settle cases, try to resolve cases, and also to try to, uh, where there was a, where, where there is a parent uh, breach of fundamental rights, where uh, they, they would uh, intervene. But I see now, and I, I, I must say, I see that also in criminal cases, that I see now that uh, they are not as flexible as they used to be. So there is a friend of mine in the attorney general's department. He told me, he said, uh, the, uh, you know, we, there is something we call the, we say the highest traditions of the attorney general's department. Uh, he, so he laughed and say, he said, no, he said, we don't uh, believe in that any longer. So uh, I, I do think that the attorney general must go back to that, uh, to the department, must, must go back to the past where the where the department acted in the highest tradition. This is not only in respect of fundamental rights, but also in uh, criminal matters, in criminal prosecutions. And this is where I think 
the uh, I think this is any uh, very important office. It's uh, the, uh, one of the most important constitutional officers in this country. And we, uh, when we, we are talking of constitutional amendments, we must look at uh, strengthening the the independence of that office. But at the same time, I think also uh, not only must an office be independent, but also that those who are holding so that those, these officers must also be made accountable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Piris. I think we now have a, a rich collection of responses and questions and also provocations uh, that we can take up. Uh, what I propose now is to read out the questions and comments already placed in the Q&A and in the chat. And I will come back to each panelist in the order in which uh, you've all spoken so far. And then we can take perhaps uh, uh, maybe two more rounds in the time that we have. I think we can go up to 8 p.m. So I would kindly request participants who have questions or comments to place them in the Q&A. Uh, and we will try to uh, collect them. And I will invite the panelists to respond. So let me uh, read out about Arvinita, three. Sorry. Can I yes. Can I just get back very quickly on just two of the issues across the, yeah. the response? So Sanjit, yeah, when I I'll read them out, no, I'll read these out, and then you can take a little bit more time to respond first because you will speak first, and then sure. respond to the questions as well. I think that might uh, help us to generate more discussion if that's okay. Um, okay, so. We have an anonymous, anonymous attendee who raises uh, the following question. Is it possible for any attorney at law, let alone the attorney general, to wear two hats, like Ms. Bari says in an application? One as attorney general for the state to be heard, and the other to be defending the respondent if the attorney general is retained. Isn't there an inherent conflict of interest? Which duty should trump? Second question. Do you think the Attorney General may be liable to a sort of negligence by a member of the public for failing to represent the interests of the state as Attorney General by defending executive or administrative action as counsel retained for the respondent? And the final question for this round is by uh, Mario. So, the, commission, the commissions of inquiry appointed in the 1990s suggested the establishment of a separate human rights office to prosecute public officers who may have violated fundamental rights. Would Sanjit or any other on the panel wish to comment? Thank you. So Sanjit, you may respond to the panelists and then offer your responses and then I will uh, um, manage the floor. Over yeah. to you. So I'm just uh, which is, uh, responding to uh, this body, but also to some of the other ideas that came in. Um, about the idea of uh, appearing like the, the its role in the relation to prosecutions and like withdrawing prosecutions or appearing in fundamental rights, one of the one of the uh, frameworks for looking at this issue that I have suggested in the paper is that uh, I think it's helpful to look at that uh, framework that point number three that I make about the the, two, the, the attorney general's two clients. So I have no, I am like the, uh, I think we have to admit that the attorney general's department comprises lawyers, but lawyers playing a very unique kind of role. Uh, and, and so I have no issue with uh, prosecutions that are being withdrawn or decisions being taken not to prosecute. Because if you maintain that framework that we are being paid by public money and we are acting in the public interest, and that is your primary motivating concern. So we are going to be wasting the time of court, wasting the time of our officers by pursuing this litigation, which we are confident will end up in an acquittal because we do not have the evidence. Or after having filed the case, uh, on the first day of hearing you, some evidence is brought up that effectively undermines your entire case. Deciding to withdraw it rather than wasting the time of court and of your officers in pro like seeing it through until the end. I think there is nothing wrong with that, so long as it is motivated by that concern that my true client, which is the public, is going to be defrauded by my relentlessly pursuing this prosecution. Because at the end of the day, we are not likely to get the result. So, so long as that is the motivating concern, I have no issue with any of that. So, I think that same framework applies to the Attorney General 
uh, appearing in fundamental rights cases. So for instance, I mean, I think I've used the analogy in the paper. If the, in good faith, the president uh, imposes a state of emergency and enacts some emergency regulations, and some private citizens are inconvenienced by it and try to uh, uh, litigate it and challenge the decision. If the tr AG's true client, ultimate client, which is the people, are being served by those regulations and the public interest or national security is genuinely being promoted by the imposition of those regulations, then the AG uh, can in good faith defend that and should defend it. But not because the president or some other functionary went ahead and Im implemented them, but because the AG's ultimate client, which is the public, is being served by defending that decision. So it's really a, like, I mean, it's, uh, it's really a question of cases where, as uh, Mr. Piri said, you know, it is blatantly on the face of it, some of these things. And I, and I, start, the, uh, I start the paper with a discussion of the uh, dissolution case, where on the face of the provisions, uh, there appeared to be an unconstitutional act. And, uh, and it was a very difficult decision uh, for the Attorney General to try to de defend. The second thing I want to respond to very quickly is, you know, I think some of the panelists use this language about this the Attorney General, you know, acting in the highest traditions of the bar or presenting facts to court. I know a lot of people use that language. But on the flip side, litigants are entitled to a zealous defense, right? And that is why the position I take in the paper is that sometimes it may be inappropriate for the Attorney General to take on the case because it is inappropriate for the Attorney General to uh, perform that zealous defense. And in such an instance, because you can't, like the, uh, let us say it's a decision of a public officer, you can't hamstring the public officer by saying, I am only going to present facts to court and not really argue it zealously because I think there may be a violation here, I will assist court and then leave him out to dry. You know, he, he has retained you, but you're not, because he should be entitled to a zealous defense. And that is why my position is, if the attorney general doesn't think he can zealously defend it, he should not appear. He should, the attorney general or the relevant officer should say, our opinion, or it may have even been an opinion that was communicated ahead of time, that a particular course of action would be unconstitutional or would result in a violation. Then the, the that particular respondent should be told that, you know, we cannot provide this zealous defense because we have the opinion that it is a, it is a, uh, there is a violation here and we are not going to go to that extent. And, and having taken that call, then the uh, relevant respondent should be entitled to retain private counsel because it is also unfair by that respondent to say, because I am a state counsel, I am going to, uh, you know, argue this halfway or not as zealously as I would otherwise do. But the Attorney General is bound by the higher constitutional norm, and I must just respond very quickly. This third thing, whatever they put in the establishment's court can't trump the core, the substantive uh, spirit of the Constitution. And if the Constitution says the uh, Attorney General's as an organ of the government has to, uh, organ of the state has to advance fundamental rights, and just because they realize we have to write this into the establishment's code, that cannot trump the constitutional imperative on the attorney general. But to respond to those questions, I, I think uh, it partly responds, I think, to what are my first remarks to so that first question, I think, about wearing two hats. Uh, so at the initial stages of uh, uh, drafting this paper, I had taken a third position on one alternative where the Attorney General sends two officers, for example, under the Article 35, the general practice is that they name the Attorney General twice, once in his capacity under Article 134 and once in his capacity under Article 35. So where the Attorney General sends two teams, one to one as the appearing for the President having been retained and one as the Attorney General. But that to me was not feasible, not tenable, because all the officers ultimately represent the public interest so then you cannot have, you know, one, one hand saying uh, it was justified and the other hand saying uh, we think there's a violation. That's why I abandoned that. Uh, so I, 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 that, that is why I think if the Attorney General's opinion is that there is a violation, he must inform the executive or whichever functionary of that opinion and allow them to retain private counsel. Private counsel can 
argue as zealously as they want. Um, to move to the other question about the office. If you can do it briefly, I would appreciate it, Sanjay. Yeah. Uh, so, so why don't I pass on that and I okay. will let some other one, someone else respond. Thank you. Professor Gunasekar, you can respond to the questions as well as to any other remarks that you would choose to from what the panelists have said so far. Okay, uh, thank you, Dinesh. I'm sorry I didn't. This uh, reception is not very good, and I can barely hear the questions. But let me respond from the sense of what I get. I get the sense that, uh, both from what uh, Sanjit is saying and Salir and Ms. Bari, that everybody is sort of satisfied with the current situation as is. You know, they're not seeking for changes even in relation to say, for example, the possibility of taking the whole issue of prosecutions into a separate, you know, like in some countries you do have a DPP. Uh, and even in fundamental rights actions, you know, we are saying he's the attorney general, his only client is a people, but how have we demonstrated in this discussion that that is working in that way? Now, my, my point is that here, like in every other area of Sri Lankan polity, maybe our institutions, we have contradictions which are very deep. So we say the attorney general is ultimately there to, uh, you know, to be the defender of the constitution. We say that his only client is it really, which is what you're arguing for, Sanjay. And then you have another political reality, which has grown and grown and grown, where they are seen as basically public servants. Now, in the past, even the public servant had a certain autonomy before the 1972 constitution, right? We, for example, even if that's vice chancellor, I had every right to express a point of view to the minister and say, look, you know, this cannot be done because I am violating the Universities Act, for example, if you had sometimes, if you had some political, in, well, the chairman of UGC tells you, you, you know, you, you, can't, you have your minister expects you to do this. You could say that, you could take that position, but it has changed now because all these public officials in high office are perceived as part of the executive. That's why they are called public servants, you know? So if there is that contradiction, then how do we address it through the kind of, um, you know, the little things that, that we are doing? Can we address it? Can we address this contradiction? Because to me, the 78 constitution has created an ethos, it's entirely supportive. I, I don't know whether Salier and Ms. Vardy agree that it is supportive of that traditional idea of this hybrid officer who was, yes, part of the government, but had a strong independent role. If you look at the dictum, my, what is the dictum that was cited by, this is what Justice Jennings said, and which is cited in your paper. Let me read it, because it's insightful. And I take a minute to read it, uh, because Sanjit cites it. This is Lord Justice Jennings. It is settled in our constitutional law that in matters which concern the public at large, the attorney general is the guardian of the public interest. Although he is a member of government of the day, it is his duty to represent the public interest with complete objectivity and detachment. He must act independently of any external pressure from whatever quarter it may come. As a guardian of the public interest, the Attorney General has a special duty in regard to the enforcement of the law. So Sanjit, your paper is pointing to the constitutional provisions, which is reflecting that concept of the role and responsibility of the Attorney General, right? That's, that's what you're saying, that's what you're... But the unfortunate thing is this constitution does not spell out that rule anywhere. Nor, for example, does it even give him the protection of appointment and dismissal in a way 
that would foster independence. So can we, can we be skirting these institutions within the legal profession, understanding the enormous impact of, of the legal profession, the attorney general's department, because after all, the lawyers, you know, your, your lawyers are part of the bar, you know? So can we, my question is, I don't think that anything that has been discussed so far really addresses that critical con because it is a contradiction. He's an executive, and therefore perceived as part of the public service. Therefore, nobody understands his other role, which is really given in the Constitution. So that has to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gunasekara. Ms. Bari, would you like to come in? Yes, Dinesha, if I may first respond to a question that has been raised about, uh, I think the question that has been posed is whether there is sort of a conflict between the AG appearing qua AG and also for the respondent. When, uh, well, the, uh, the position is that the Attorney General appears for the public officer and uh, as a matter of course, and if it is a government cooperation that the uh, attorney general has to be retained, a public of uh, the attorney general would routinely appear for public officers, uh, subject to refusing to appear if there's an article of an allegation or a personal allegation. If there is no such article of an allegation or a personal allegation, then the, the uh, attorney general will assess the facts of the case on a case by case basis. And in, 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 in that department, I don't think I'm disagreeing with Sanjit in any way. It is just a matter of degree. The analysis of each and every officer might be different from, from the perspective of Sanjit who is not placed in the same position as the officer of the attorney general, who has looked at the uh, subject matter from the perspective of the officer who has handled the file, from the perspective of government policy, the cabinet decision, uh, the, the, uh, the, act, the where the sort of uh, the decision lies as to whether there's a violation or not, would be quite distinct from the perspective of the council appearing for the individual who perceives uh, him or herself to be aggrieved by that decision. So therefore, the, the perspective of the officer and the perspective of the private counsel would be different. So it is, that is why we have an independent judiciary to make the decision as to whether the, uh, the constitution has, has been violated or not. In the process of deciding whether to appear for the public officer, the uh, the attorney general, the state council adopts a quasi is um, has a quasi judicial function and has to decide and satisfy him or herself as to whether there has been a violation. So it is it uh, in it, to that extent I don't think Sanjit and I are at variance in any way. It's it's the quality of the analysis. I think that we are arguing about, and there I agree with uh, Professor uh, Savitri Gunasekara that there has to be more awareness. There should be clear guidelines. There should be uh, perspectives articulated. This type, type of discussion should take place so that there will be, so at this moment, it's very ad hoc. So, for instance, when I joined the department, there were people, uh, the Attorney General was. Uh, Mr. Kamala Sabeson, who very clearly told us that it is not our function when we go, uh, when we defend uh, public officers in a fundamental rights application to defend them at all costs. That we have to uh, be conscious of our constitutional role and be conscious of that balance when we appear in court. So I now the number of counsel in the department have are very large. The number has have expanded. So I really don't know whether that message it, it resonates as clearly as it did when we joined. But I think ultimately the the basic principle that Sanjit is talking about that where it is inappropriate for the attorney general to uh, take up the defense, he will not is something I think most officers in the department are aware of. It's just the degree. Uh, and the manner of analysis, I think that is a problem and the quality of analysis, which I think uh, Salia has also mentioned. So there isn't, I think, a 
in my mind has, has never been a conflict because uh, I we would only decide to, because it is the public officer's action in his official capacity that the state council would defend, not whatever he has done in his personal capacity. So it is what he has done for and on behalf of the state. So it is it is not that we we are not letting down that public officer and not sort of somehow not zealously pursuing his case when we say that you ought not to have acted in a certain manner. Because we are educating that public officer in his constitutional role at the time that we defend him. So it is not like a personal case. So they, in my mind, I have never seen a conflict. If I see uh, a transgression by, by the public officer, I would advise the person that this is a situation and we cannot appear. And if the public officers do insist that they are right, then we advise them to retain private counsel. Thank you very much. Mr. Pires? Yes, I think to what uh, Professor Gunasekara mentioned that about uh, the role of the Attorney General and uh, whether we should re-examine the different roles which the Attorney General is performing. So I think that is, that is something which ought to be looked at, whether we should have something like the Crown Prosecution Service in the United Kingdom. Uh, where you have a, well, you can either have it in a uh, way where perhaps administratively uh, the Attorney General is in charge, but there is adequate independence to the to that uh, to the criminal branch. Uh, but, so, but so this this is I think, but I think it is something which must be looked at carefully, uh, and I don't think that that is something which a rushed decision can be can be taken into account can be taken. But I do think that, uh, that that is something which we ought to look. So that again comes to the position of uh, uh, in respect of uh, the, because I think it's important that the Attorney General acts independently or the Department acts in, independently in respect of criminal matters. And also, also I want to raise this, Shaila, that uh, especially in respect of uh, violation of fundamental rights, in respect of, of matters which might acts which might be criminal, should uh, I think a distinction has to be made and that at the moment the, the AGS department does make a distinction in respect of torture, but not others. So you sometimes find state council vehemently defending for, uh, illegal arrests, unlawful arrests, uh, and refusing to concede. And uh, so, and, and also we have this, uh, the it is seen for the last 20 years or so, the, uh, the Supreme Court has started a practice of noticing and list uh, of noticing parties and hearing parties before leave is granted now when we first started uh, appearing in fundamental rights cases when uh, the chief justice was uh, mr gps de silva you you went into court you supported on your papers you uh, the attorney general was heard but really you got uh, leave on on those papers now it has changed and the court won there is a long process of notice but there we come across sometimes uh, state council make submissions from the bar table and uh, we are uh, constrained because we don't have have those documents those documents are sometimes produced or submissions are made sometimes documents are not produced submissions are made from the bar table so this is where i i, I do feel that in fundamental rights cases i think or for that matter in any other case that a full that the attorney general's department is bound to make a full disclosure of all material, and uh, I, I of course in criminal cases uh, there is uh, the Vijay Pala's judgment where Justice Mark Fernando says the duty of the prosecutor to ensure that the that the duty is to ensure that justice is done and that there is no miscarriage of justice. Thank you, Mr. Pires. Uh, we have about 20 minutes and we have several questions and comments. I will read them out and uh, go in the reverse order. So we will start with Mr. Pires first so that we can also then end with uh, Sanjit and let him have the last say uh, for tonight at least on these questions. Uh, and I'm afraid uh, as, as generative as this discussion has been, we will have to close at 8. So. Um, there's a question about uh, justification or the absence of green light under the PTA and uh, I'm reading this out. This make executive to use AG to use PTA and ICCPR to exercise arbitrary detention. So I, 
I think the question is about the AG's advice on detention under these two pieces of uh, legislation. Uh, coming back to the Q&A, um, can an attorney at law take into account the rules governing the conduct of an attorney, such as conflict of interest, ever perform the constitutional role of the attorney general? Uh, Pabba asks this question, uh, and this is to Sanjit. Would you would like you to clarify whether my understanding is correct on the point you made about bills that by routinely signing off on government bills, the role of the attorney general has been reduced to that of a mere rubber stamp, by virtue of which the attorney general is guilty of dereliction of duty, that is, the failure to defend constitutional democracy, and by implication, the interests of the public. Uh, in this background, the next question, how does the panel view the exemption of the AG's department from the Right to Information Act? Constitutionally speaking, should it have been? Two more, what is the rationale of refusing to defend an Article 11 allegation as opposed to any other fundamental right? Are not they all fundamental rights? Isn't that discussion what Sanjit in fact argues for all fundamental rights applications? And the last comment, there are situations where the Attorney General appears for public officers with the cost of public interest. Wish to hear from Salia about the recent example of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka's application demanding the Supreme Court to give directions to the government of Sri Lanka to come with interim policies and how the Attorney General stands with the application. So thank you to all participants for these uh, questions. I will now uh, come back to Mr. Piris and then go in the reverse order and we'll end with Sanjit. Thank you. Right. Uh, so I, I, I don't think the question on our recent case and uh, the AG stand on that application, I don't think it would be fair an ongoing case for me to uh, discuss uh, how uh, that uh, on how the Attorney General made submissions or not. But suffice it to say, uh, what I said generally that uh, about uh, what I think that uh, that uh, I, I share with Sanjit the view that the Attorney General's primary duty is to the is to the state but state is not to the government of the day but the state where the the, the state which is also uh, uh, represented where the public uh, the sovereign public uh, are concerned. So the, I would stop at that. But the age where the PPA matters are concerned, that is of, of a matter of concern. Because again, these relate to criminal prosecution. But again, here you, you find the find law people in long years of deten, uh, detention. I have come across people de, uh, in detention for 10, 11, 12 years. And uh, where the trials uh, go on and on. And here, of course, I must say in all these criminal prosecutions, uh, there is a tendency of prosecutors also to uh, very much, uh, at least in the first stages, to act on what the police say. So we have other instances also prominent where of instances of where we, you know where prominent arrests were made, people detained for say uh, one or two years, and at the outset the prosecutors also go along with what the what the CID what the police feed them, and uh, make uh, and then year, one or two years down the line you know you are proved to be false. So this is where I, I think it is necessary. Uh, I think I'm happy that Shahida mentioned Mr. Kamala Sabesa. I think uh, Mr. Kamala Sabesa is one of the, these the, those attorney generals. I think who who really acted uh, in what we call the best traditions of the AGES department. Okay, he's not only he, but in criminal matters, I've seen Mr. Palito Fernando as attorney general uh, playing a very uh, impartial, independent role. And, uh, and, and to ensure that justice is, was done. So I, I think that is that is important. But certainly I think we must review, but it's not only the Attorney General's role in respect of the PTA, but I think the, uh, it's a broader issue of the, P, the PTA itself being uh, draconian. So those are my observations on what has been asked. The other question on Article 11, I think the Article 11 distinction is made with Article 11 uh, is in itself criminal. So a violation of Article 12, for instance, uh, a child not being admitted to school might, uh, is, is more civil in nature. Whereas Article 11, we would also invoke criminality and where the Attorney General would have to indict the person for. So that is where the distinction is made and the AG does not appear in torture cases. But my view is perhaps they should go beyond that. 
and also look at certain instances where illegal arrests have been made. Because those also border on criminality. Thank you, Mr. Pires. Uh, Ms. Bari? Yes, with uh, regard to our, the Article 11 issue, I would also add to what uh, Sali has said, quite apart from the fact that uh, the when an allegation of Article 11 is made, there's a criminal, uh, it is criminal and the, there will be a conflict if the AG appears, because there might in all probably be, uh, all probability be a prosecution. In uh, 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 allegation of torture is objectively ascertainable. If the, if the um, material is prima facie reliable, it's objectively ascertainable and it's easier for the attorney general to make a decision not to appear. Whereas in most cases, it will be uh, allegations of being arbitrary or unreasonable or perverse. And all of they, they, there's a lot of subjectivity involved in many of those fundamental rights applications. So in, in, in that respect, it is not as easy for an officer to make a decision um, objectively as to where, where exactly the line has to be drawn. So in, it is in this gray area sometimes that the difficult questions arise. I do uh, agree with Salia that if there is criminality involved, there is, there is this spectrum between the, the, the arbitrary, unreasonable civil kind of disputes and there's the Article 11 dispute where there is there's no, no doubt as to where whether the AG should appear and that there are these in-between cases where there could eventually be criminal uh, allegations where there, in, in those respects, I think, uh, there should be clearer guidelines and more sort of uh, guidance at a senior level as to how these uh, files should be handled. And I uh, resonate, I think, uh, with uh, what Professor Gunasekar has said that it is timely to have clear, defined guidelines. I do not subscribe to the view that the Office of the Attorney General should be emasculated. What I think should be done is that we should fight for it, uh, freedom from interference from political actors, that clearer guidelines should be laid down as to how the junior and senior officers should um, conduct themselves, and also that when the, the that there should not be interference at, 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 at any level, rather than emasculating and breaking it down and sort of uh, making it dysfunctional, I think the impetus has to be to make it a more independent organization. Thank you, Ms. Bari. Before I go to Professor Gunasekar and Sanjit, uh, Sanjit has kindly alerted me to the fact that one of the participants has raised. Uh, I think that was a, I, that's okay, but that was an accident, so that's okay. Okay, all right, okay, thanks. Thanks, Anjit. Uh, okay, so we still have a few questions that uh, need to be addressed, particularly the question about the RTI Act as well. Uh, so, Professor Gunasekar, would you uh, like to come in to comment? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't answer the question on the RTI because I'm really shocked. I can't, I, I cannot recall a provision in the Constitution which says uh, in any way that they are exempt. I don't know if it's part of Article 14. I don't know. Uh, and, uh, and also how that is there a specific provision? I don't know. So I it's can't come in on that. Communications, Professor. Communications. Because I can understand that there could be some confidential areas which would come within, uh, within. Uh, but I can't say that there would be a blanket, blanket cover. That's very difficult and I have no information on that. But I just want to comment on uh, some of this, uh, you know, the, the, the question about torture. I see that very much is linked to the Torture Act, because torture, uh, a person can be prosecuted for torture under the Torture Act. And then there, there's this uh, complex dynamic, because you try to defend him then, and then ultimately you will have to also be part of the prosecuting process. So I have a sense, and I may be wrong, but that has influenced 
the reason for the AGS department taking a different role in cases where a pub, uh, where a police officer or law enforcement officer is accused of torture. And that is why there's a focus on that as opposed to anything else. But let me say that the problem is that this can also depend on the approach of an individual uh, attorney general. In other words, a highly personalized, you know, policy at a particular time. For example, as I said, I think, Professor Gunasekara, the connection is uh, not very good. Uh, not appearing for the uh, uh, Commission of uh, Immigration and Immigration, who was enforcing this uh, extremely discriminatory regulation preventing uh, women who had married foreigners from uh, applying for uh, citizenship of their houses, stopping all kinds of restrictions, but not regarding the status. This is a violation of the constitution. And Shama said that he had informed that he would not appear. In, uh, in, so it given on the individual. And I say this also because I recall, for instance, uh, so near going to this in the case of the in, in, in Richard Soiza murder case, where there was a very a public controversy of the Attorney General entering a nolle prosecu and re refusing to prosecute, despite the fact that the magistrate who did the first inquiry suggested that that, that, that was enough for a non-summary. Uh, this was a public issue of concern. And uh, the current Attorney General, who was uh, the late Shibli Aziz, and uh, Silva, who was then president of the um, of the federal government, also been the attorney general's department, who was president of the court of appeal, were uh, expressed diametrically opposite views on this. Shibli Aziz said, "Well, uh, quite contrary to what you are saying, Sajid, Sanjit, that the attorney general is chief legal advisor of government. He is a public servant. He has a role in that." Whereas uh, Sarat Silva, Justice Sarat Silva, and was more in line with what you said. So this is the point that we have a situation where, uh, irrespective of what you say, Ms. Bari and Salia, with regard to the fact that, you know, the attorney general follows protocol, uh, it will ask persons, for instance, if they feel there are no merits in the case, the fundamental rights case, they will tell the person to retain private counsel. It tends to depend on individuals rather than systems. So my point is, can you introduce systemic uh, regulation within the current ambivalence with regard to this hybrid role, or to there be clarity through the constitution, which then gets the essence of the hybrid role, but which fosters the idea that ultimately, both in prosecutions and in the important area of fundamental rights, it is non-political, completely free of pressure, uh, public pressure. That's a challenge. Excellent. Thank you very much, Professor Gunasekara. Sanjit, you uh, get about eight minutes. Thank you. Yeah. So I think uh, I'm very grateful to uh, Ms. Bari's input. I think that has uh, perhaps one of the issues is that a lot of this information uh, is not publicly available. And so that, that is one of the issues that affects the perception of the Attorney General's Department. But I will so I will respond to a few of these questions uh, on the question of the bills and the routine signing off. Um, I think I uh, I'm not sure there was a real question in that, but I think I agree with the statement that they were saying. I'm not sure about dereliction of duty, but in a sense, what I'm saying is that the, if the attorney general has signed off, so I have a I have a separate question about how 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th the diametrically opposed constitutions, how the same Supreme Court could have held that all are uh, 
how a court could have held that all uh, are, do not require a referendum. That's a separate question. But the linked question is, if they are so diametrically opposite, how can the same department, if we claim that the department acts to a certain degree with independence, how can the same department sign off on those diametrically opposed bills? And that is why I am led to the conclusion, I, I surmise in the paper, that it appears that it cannot be that in every one of those instances, uh, it, it was the genuine opinion that the bill is constitutional. Again, I, now this is conjecture because I don't know. But the perception based on that trend is that uh, is that the Attorney General's department sees itself uh, and sees its role as being to defend government bills. And that is reinforced by the fact that the only time that they uh, uh, appear to challenge bills is when they're private members' bills and private members' bills that are typically moved by uh, members of the opposition. So, so there is a uh, so so there is a concern there. Uh, in response to Professor Gunasekara's remarks about like clarifying things at a constitutional level, I have considered that in the paper. I have said that uh, you know more substantive constitutional changes are pro probably necessary to uh, clarify these issues of concept and principle about what is the role of the Attorney General's Department. I actually wanted to remark earlier on that it's curious that as high and functionary as the president and all these organs are specifically mentioned in the constitution, they are constituted, but the Attorney General's Department is pre-constitutional. And without being mentioned saying there shall be an attorney general's department, the constitution in passing makes reference, assuming this institution exists, which then in a, in a sense really elevates the attorney general's department above even the office of the executive president, uh, because the president is identified and created by the constitution. The Supreme Court is created by the constitution, but the attorney general's department is given a duty by the constitution, but assumed to have already existed. Uh, of course, as I mentioned in the paper, the provisions in the constitution it say that existing law and so on continue. There are transitional provisions that gives effect to the provisions that created the Attorney General's Department. But I still think it's strange that having conferred a constitutional mandate on that department, that it, it is not constituted in any way in the constitution. So I think, so I, I concede Professor Gunasekara's point that there should be and perhaps again whether it's a department of public prosecutions or whether those three functions should actually be separate entirely constitutional role the civil role and then the uh, prosecution uh, prosecution role i think the center for policy alternatives has uh, written a paper published a paper on that in 2020 exploring some of those ideas but uh, the bottom line and I, and I want to draw again on this uh, allegation of thoughts or what uh, ms bari said is that it seems to be then, apart from the angle of having to prosecute it under the Torture Act, that if there is a clear manifest violation of the constitution or fundamental right, then it's inappropriate for the Attorney General to appear. And that is one of the arguments that I draw on to say that uh, even if it is the president that is doing this, the Attorney General has the discretion on whether or not to appear. Uh, actually, most, even though that is the meat of my uh, the the crux of my paper, the discussion was a little more uh, general, I think. But again, and, and I'm pushing very hypothetical scenarios. But supposing the uh, president makes a declaration under the state of emergency, citing, uh, this, I mean, hypothetical, but citing a, a threat to personal security or threat to personal safety or something, entirely arbitrary, entirely uh, uh, irrational. Right and entirely for a uh, ulterior motive, collateral purpose. Uh, can we really? It is the constitution envisage that the attorney general is still sandwiched between that rock and the hard place and told to defend the action. And that is why my paper says that he, he is not required to do that. And the constitutional scheme he seems to give him give that office that discretion that if it is a blatantly unconstitutional act. The, 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 and, and to defend that executive functionary would be to collude in a breach of the constitution or to collude in a violation of the public's fundamental rights. 
if the attorney general has the discretion to refuse, even to refuse the president. Uh, although that didn't get much action, perhaps later on people may read the article and say something about it. But I want to conclude, we are going back to 1981, uh, but a very recent decision of uh, Justice Koda Goda, that is in Vijay Ratna versus Sri Lanka Ports Authority, uh, he talks about the general duty of attorney generals uh, of attorneys to the court. But uh, I'll, I'll read out his concluding passage. Therefore, officers of the attorney general's department are required to actively aid court in the discovery of the truth and administer justice according to law. It is of critical importance to bear in mind that officers of the attorney general's department are duty bound to act in the best interest of the state, as doing so would be in the public interest. Thus, the overall objective of legal professional serving the state should be the protection and fostering of public interest. Protecting and acting in the best interest of the state and public officials is circumscribed by the overarching professional duty legal officers of the state have towards courts to assist in the administrative uh, administration of justice. Legal officers of the state are certainly not required and should not protect or defend public officials who have committed any illegality or otherwise acted contrary to law. So I think Ms. Bari said at one point that, I mean, that's a very jurisprudential question. Whether the violation only takes place and the Supreme Court says there is a violation or not, I don't take that view. I think this internal process of the law, when the act itself happens, there is a sense of whether a fundamental right has been violated or not. And so I think when the Attorney General is of the opinion that there is in fact a violation, whether or not subsequently the Supreme Court holds there to be a violation, which is certainly when it becomes conclusive, but even the Supreme Court's decisions sometimes are wrongly decided and Supreme Court's, I mean, a later court may overturn that. Uh, I think that that portion effectively captures the position that I, that I have tried to argue in the paper, that uh, when there is a clear uh, illegality or a, an action contrary to the law, that the Attorney General's Department is not bound to appear and defend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanjit. Um, a good academic paper or a robust or well-developed academic paper uh, sheds light on a problem, explores the different contours of the problem and uh, in the insights it offers, it generates debate. And I think the two hours that we spent together on this Zoom call is evidence that Sanjit has discharged that burden quite effectively. So thank you, Sanjit, and let me also congratulate you for writing this paper uh, and thank you for sharing it with us uh, so that we could have this uh, important but also timely conversation about the constitutional role of Sri Lanka's Attorney General. I would also like to thank very specially our panelists this evening, Professor Gunasekara, Mr. Piris and Ms. Bari, uh, I know each of you had practical challenges in remaining on this call throughout the last two hours. Uh, so despite those difficulties, uh, uh, you all uh, made a very strong response to Sanjit's argument and I have no doubt that that has uh, been both useful and also an encouragement to him. And I also would like to thank all the participants for your active engagement. Uh, and in conclusion, I would also like to thank uh, Mario Gomez and ICS and also for the Indian Law Review for co-hosting this event. What remains for me now is to say good night and thank you all. Good evening.